The views and opinions of this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers. There is substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options, which you should carefully consider prior to trading. Make sure to subscribe to the Market Talk YouTube channel. You can watch our latest interviews with top market analysts in the country, find bonus content, and much more. It's easy. Just go to youtube.com slash at Market Talk Egg and hit the subscribe button. Or you can search for Market Talk Egg on YouTube. Well, as we wrapped up the trade action on Wednesday, that soy complex was soaring higher with us putting some 12s on the board. Meal and bean oil were supportive as well. Wheat and corn, kind of a quiet downward day. Well, corn just kind of asleep at the wheel. And we have the Federal Reserve wrapping up their two-day meeting on Wednesday. So we got a lot to talk about joining us now. Mike Zuzalo with Global Commodity Analytics is with us. Mike, good to catch up with you again. And, uh, there's my setup, a few different things for us to talk about. I suppose we should start with the Federal Reserve and just uh, what we saw from their meeting. I know the dot plot out as well. A lot of folks will chatter about that. Uh, your take on what the Federal Reserve didn't or did say on Wednesday. Yeah, about 45 minutes into the actual policy statement being put out as we talk, Jesse, the, the Federal Reserve chairman, uh, Mr. Powell is starting his press conference. I would say my takeaway right now, and I'll go into more detail on the blog post, which I feature your video on every Wednesday. Um, but I think my takeaway right now is the Fed is allowing more inflation into the economy by their specific policy moves. And so that quote, higher for longer mindset is sticking in the financial markets right now in reaction initially to this policy update. Um, it, it would be classified, I think, as a dovish policy move because they're allowing more uh, in inflation into the economy here in 2024 than I think what the financial markets were expecting. The big question is why would they wanna do that? And I think for me, it goes back to um, the Fed wants to keep three interest, rate high, uh, three interest rate cuts in their policy and they stated that today but how are they going to do that and still have higher inflation? Um, and the takeaway right now in the financial markets is how can you have both when they contradict one another? And I think it really boils down to the Fed wants to stay dovish and wants to cut rates because we're at the highest rates right now in 23 years. And I'm still very nervous, as we've talked about for several months now, going all the way back to late 2023, I'm still very nervous about a U.S. recession because some of the historical indicators are suggesting a recession coming around uh, in the second half of this uh, this calendar year. And so I think the recessionary fears, um, while the Fed probably won't say it today in their press conference, I think it's there and they want to be extra protective. And that's why they want to cut rates is to avoid a recession, especially in an election year. So that I think works from a standpoint of new highs in equities and new lows in the dollar. The crude oil did not move much, but wheat cut its losses in half. And I think when you look at everything in totality, at least at this point, the, the market took this as a very dovish uh, update and that the, maybe the Fed is acknowledging inflation is on the supply side and they can't do much about it at this stage. Plus, maybe just maybe there's some recessionary indicators still looming out there. Well, good thoughts. Uh, let's look at a yield curve chart that you sent me here on our video feed to also kind of look at some of your points here with what the Fed is saying. And we can kind of bridge this over into commodities here in a minute. Talk to me about what you're seeing on this yield curve chart right now. Yeah, this really is kind of the genesis. And I'm glad you framed it that way. This really does matter a lot about the commodity side of the equation because we're still waiting for that launch of the commodities in terms of going higher because the Federal Reserve is done being hawkish. And so we did get a report today that I would classify as dovish. So let's see what this market can do. Before we answer that, though, I want to talk about the recessionary pressures with you and give the, the listener and the viewer the things that I'm looking at. And I'll add more to this to the client blog post today uh, or tonight. But this is our yield curve, as you say, two-year bond yield minus the 10-year. Typically, you're going to have a uh, higher yield curve uh, in, the, uh, in the longer duration, the 10-year bonds, because you're keeping someone's money longer and they deserve to be paid more for that. 
What we see, though, is the yield, the interest paid on the two year is above the 10 year. And it really has been ever since the, the pandemic when we went in 2022, um, the 10 year stayed relatively flat and the, and the two year just shot out after mid 2021. The two flat lines in red that I show you, that's the last time that we've seen the two year yield above the 10 year yield, that inversion in the yield curve as they would call it. And those were both recession years, 2000, uh, 1999 through 2001. And then again, that 2006, 2007 time period. And, and I guess I would say it this way too, just from an anecdotal perspective, Jesse, agriculture is feeling recessionary right now. I, I've spoken to several clients and I've, I've said to them, I really feel like it's not diff too much different than how it felt around the financial crisis or around that 2000 time period. And they have heartily agreed with what's going on in agriculture right now. And I think if you're not invested in the stock market, you're not living very well right now, if you ask me. So I think this is really a warning flag that we could still have a recession out there. All right. Well, let's build the bridge a little bit over into commodities here. I'll pull up the uh, chart you sent with SRW and uh, the U.S. dollar. Of course, uh, we talk a lot, you and I do, about wheat and the need for wheat to be the upside leader here. So walk me through wheat action. Again, you mentioned it kind of came off its lows on Wednesday. It was a good sign to finish. Uh, your thoughts with some of this correlation between wheat and the dollar right now, Mike? Yeah, I mean, this is where it goes back to the dollar in general is a good inflation deflation indicator. And when the dollar is strong, that suggests that we are deflationary in the world in terms of interest rates. When the dollar is weak, that is inflationary, generally speaking. There are exceptions, but I think this chart really shows really nicely going all the way back to the mid 1970s. And this is some of this neat analysis that I can do with some of the powerful uh, analytical tools that I have at my disposal. Um, you, you can go all the way back to 1976 and you can generally look at this chart and say, okay, when the orange line is making a high and making a peak, that's the US dollar. Um, when it's making a peak, you're seeing the US wheat, soft red wheat at major lows or near major lows. And if you're wanting to see the wheat, which is your bar chart on an annual basis, if you wanna see the wheat make major highs, you almost always need to have the dollar in the very low end of its trading range over the last 30 or 40 years. And, and what will go all the way to the very last bar, you see the orange line tick higher. You now have the orange line going above its 2021, 2022 highs on an annual basis. That dollar is getting revved up. All of a sudden, that's corresponded with that fresh four-year low in the soft red wheat. So you don't have to know anything about economics if you don't want to. Um, but this chart really does show the power of a strong dollar and how it can really hurt our wheat market. And obviously that goes back to the exports and the imports because there's so many competitors out there, especially Russia. Um, but it also su suggests that this is about inflation and about investment flows and risky assets. All right. Soybeans were a high flyer on Wednesday, Mike. Let's look at the uh, Nov bean chart here on the video feed. And, and you know, I, I said this uh, a couple days ago. I said if beans could get some 12s on the board here, would that spur some farmers selling? Well, we had 12s on the board all the way out to the new crop November contract on Wednesday at the close. So your thoughts on that? Could we see some increased farmer selling or is there maybe some more upside to come here in soybeans, Mike. I think we could see both here, Jesse, going into the acreage report based upon the technicals in this chart. But to answer your question about the farmer selling is yes, I've heard a lot of farmer selling. I've been recommending some of the producers that are not caught up with me on 23 sales to get moving and have no more than about 20% of their old crop beans left at this $12 level in, in the May beans. Um, and, and obviously the fact that we're still sitting at around that $12 level uh, in the November is only about a 10 cent difference between the two. Um, you could say the same thing. I'm not ready to pull the next trigger on the new crop yet, in, the, in part because of this chart. But yes, I've, I've talked to some producers in Northwest Ohio today, and they said there are several lines, long lines of beans at processing facilities 
uh, around that area, and I suspect that's the case pretty much all around the country right now. This is an important feature, by the by the way, as a side note to how important that grain stocks report is for both corn and beans, and hopefully we've drained the tank in terms of bins on farm in both corn and beans versus September. And that's not as big of a negative feature after next week's numbers. But yeah, this chart is really nice because the blue trend line that we broke above uh, late last week, we went down and tested that. So we took resistance, took it out, and now we've confirmed it as support. And we have a gap in the chart now at around 1240. And this is November beans. Um, I really like the idea of the if I'm standing by the idea based upon that previous chart we just looked at that if the wheat and the corn and the beans can all work together that that gap could be on the table especially with the very damaging rains being reported in Argentina right now because that would give you a meal led rally and I think that's what we saw on Wednesday especially in percentage terms and I think it would also indicate that if we've got damage in Argentina and soybeans we've probably got damage in the corn, even though the flooding obviously is going to hurt beans first, but it should give you enough punch that the corn will willingly follow if the, if the wheat's not pounding on it. So my take is very simple. This is a consolidation phase. We're going to try potentially to go above $12, go towards that 50% retracement level around 1220. If we can take that out, then you really have very little resistance in the way of trying to fill that 1240 plus gap. And this is what I'm saying to clients and subscribers right now. If we could manage to do that before next week's two big reports, the acreage and stocks, I want to be heavily hedged in, in 24 beans in a manner that gives me upside potential. But if I could clear $12 cash around the country or get close to $12 cash because of the U.S.-China trade relationship, because of the U.S. election, um, I'd really want to get that locked in and secured and then focus on the grain side of the equation. We are joined today by Mike Zuzalo with Global Commodity Analytics here on Market Talk. Mike, let's talk about those reports coming up from USDA on the 28th. Always uh, can be a volatile report, can have their surprises, quarterly grain stocks and prospective plantings. And this is uh, a chart looking at uh, the planted acres historically. Uh, give us some of your thoughts of what you're thinking heading into that report here next week and what we could possibly expect, Mike? Well, we're rotating towards the bigger bean, smaller corn rotation. And I think this is what's so confounding in the trade as far as what's next. And, and so I think that's first and foremost is we probably, um, we know we're coming off 94.9 million corn acres and 83.6 million bean acres. So we should rotate towards more beans not unlike what we saw in 2016 going into 2017, where we actually had 94 million corn in, in 16 and then went to 90.2 in, in 17, 18. And so I'm very close to USDA. And because of that, I'm pretty far apart from a lot of the private people out there, my colleagues that are much higher in corn and much lower in soybeans. Um, and so my mindset is, is that we shouldn't be that much different from last year, even taking on more corn acres or get, being able to take on more corn acres. The other thing to note, and in, in, in the, the, the last set of numbers is my expectation for 24, 25. The, the one before that is USDA. And I have that highlighted with that red arrow at the very bottom of the chart. Um, one thing you'll also see is that the rice, sorghum, barley, oats numbers I've pumped up. I've really pumped up the cotton number um, because of the profitability there, but I've got to realize that it looks very wet in the cotton areas. And so this is a snapshot of what I think is going to be shown in March, but then it's all about the weather. So my basic principle right now, Jesse, based upon client conversations as late as today is that the central corn belt will push harder into corn. That'll keep the acreage base pretty solid but the, front, the, the eastern and western belts, not fringes, but the eastern and western belts um, will probably pick up more bean acres, especially in eastern Indiana and western Ohio, especially if they have heavier ground where they had 70, 80 bushel bean yields last uh, year. I, I think it goes with, it's very important to realize, I think this new type of mm -hmm. crop insurance, the CPO type mindset where you can get up to 90, 95% of your APH, that, that 
really keeps you stuck in rotation depending on what you can really pump out as far as yields because you get that kind of a APH level guaranteed, you're probably not going to try and mess it up with jumping out of rotation. And I would add to that, I am with you in this camp. I think that that central corn belt's going to see more of those corn acres. And I'm just judging this not off any sort of data, but off the fact that, you know, we had a really mild winter and a lot of fall application of fertilizer for corn. So that's where my bias is leaning that, hey, you know, beans may not overtake corn per se in acreage, but that number might be a little bit closer than some folks are thinking, Mike. I'm glad you brought that up because I agree, number one. And number two, USDA and their Agricultural Outlook Forum in the talking about new crop acres actually spoke about Illinois in, in the state Illinois numbers and the USDA, NAS in, in Illinois um, being a good barometer for the overall acreage. So if I'm wrong and we have bigger corn acres, then I would expect that Illinois and Iowa um, and those states that we're able to really run hard um, and there's tillage going on right now here in, in northeastern Kansas. Um, we're ready to plant essentially, but that's where I think that if we had bigger corn acres, it's going to be because of that central corn belt. Well, let's talk livestock here, Mike, and let's think about cattle. We got a cattle on feed report coming up at the end of the week. I kind of feel like this cattle trades may be marking time ahead of that report already. And we're looking at uh, the monthly feeder chart here on the video feed as well. I guess just your overall thoughts, cattle, here as we work through midweek, Mike. Let's talk about the charts first because I'm going to give you two different scenarios here, Jesse, um, based upon the cattle and feed estimates that came out here earlier this week and late last week. Um, this chart is kind of a textbook example right now of a double top pattern where you had the high back in September of last year. And last month, we tried to check that high in feeders, did not go above it. We did do that, in fact, cattle. And so that's an interesting dynamic where one has and one has not. And it puts more pressure, I think, on, on the feeder cattle to be able to continue this type of rally. Um, I would also say that the stochastic oscillator at the bottom, those two squiggly lines at the bottom of the chart, were back into a, quote, buy signal um, in that stochastic. And so it would suggest to me, this monthly chart would suggest to me that if you're going to go through that high, you better do it pretty soon or you're going to start running out of runway space. And what I mean by that is going all the way back to 2014, 2015, you see a double, another double top. We had that 2014 high in the fall. Um, then you had the June 2015 high of 227.80. Um, so we don't look like 2015 right now in feeder cattle. And, and this is the model that I continue to work from. So setting that aside, looking at a chart that's defensive, I would also say that we have very aggressive marketings on the cattle on feed report estimates. Um, 1.8 million head. That's the same as last month. That's going to be almost 4% more than last year for February. I can buy into that some, um, but it's a very aggressive number. So you're kind of putting a lot of burden to take the fat cattle higher without getting a good number on Friday's report. Um, the second thing I'd say is the placements. Uh, the trade is thinking a, a 104.5 to 108.8. It's very narrow range compared to what we're used to. That's a 1.85 million head placements figure. I would be surprised at that big of a placements figure simply because if you bought a 260 pound steer um, at this point in time, um, you need a break even of 186. Well, 186 by my calculations anyway, that's exactly where October fat cattle are. So are you really going to place a lot to get break even or are you hoping for more a, a better price? But I just feel like that placement number seems a little bit aggressive. If it is aggressive, then we should be able to try and retest those September highs and feeders. And if we can do that, I think you hedge that next rally. All right. I want to ask you hogs real quick as well before we wrap it up. Uh, our our friends uh, on the pig side feels like we are getting a little bit up against resistance here. That's the feeling I've had all week long in this trade. You know, hundred dollar summer hogs, great price, but it just feels like we don't have enough juice to bust through some of these overhead technical uh, barriers. Is that kind of how you view the hog trade right now, Mike? I do because I think it's very heavily weighted towards the idea of the currencies and the export import market now that we're through the Easter season. And we've noticed the bellies holding in there very nicely, kind of 
watching everything, but the hams have slid. And so the liquidation of the Easter seasonal has taken place. What's holding us up, I think, right now, Jesse, and this goes back to the currencies, is the Chinese hog market. It has found another, you know, kind of um, reason to rally. And it's it's been able to find another strong move up here for the most part this week. And I think that's played a role in keeping the market's expectations high. And USDA's Livestock Dairy and Poultry Report last week said it too, that pork exports are going to remain firm. And I think as long as we have that, you can justify these $100 hog prices, but you don't want any slippage whatsoever right here, right now. All right, Mike, final thoughts from you. Anything else you want to share or reiterate for folks today? No, I just say pick up a trial on globalcomresearch.com and, and take a look at our research and our analysis because I think a lot of things are coming together, um, especially because it's before planting, you know, get kind of in a routine to elevate that marketing and elevate your analysis uh, on farm. Well, Mike, always appreciate the time. Thanks for joining us here on Market Talk today. Have a great week, sir. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Jesse. You too. Mike Zuzalo there with Global Commodity Analytics. That's going to do it for Market Talk here today. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jesse Allen. Have a great rest of your day.